depicted there saying one built upon a solid rock. If you look over at the book of Luke, it means that he dug deep and he dug wide. It took work to get to the foundation, but he built upon a very strong foundation. One built upon the sand. And of course, when the floods came and the rains came and the wind blew, one house stood strong. One house was completely destroyed. And saying that we need to apply all of that to our lives, everything he said, the things that I've taught, the things that I've preached, those are the things that you're to apply to your house. Now, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is our foundation. We believe that we build upon Christ, upon the foundation of salvation, so that our lives will stand strong. And I was thinking this week and <clears throat> the last several weeks on this and a tremendous story in the Bible in 1 Kings 21 that I want to try to tie into last week's and really for us to understand that we have to stand strong. We have to uh, not give in to what the world wants from us. I believe this is God's church, not my church. I believe that in Matthew 16, it says, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is God's church. And if we remove God out of the church, we remove doctrine, we remove the Bible, God will stamp Ichabod on the front, and it no longer will be his church. It'll be our church. Now we come, I, I was, I've read this before, seen it before, and <clears throat> watched a, a pastor this week and listening, and, 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 and I uh, could uh, understand everything he was saying. He said, so often I get calls and they'll say, what do you have to offer? What, do you ha what does your church have to offer? He said, remember, we don't come to church to get something. We come to church to worship the God of heaven. That's why we come to church. Yes, we ought to get something out of the service, but we ought to come for one purpose, and that's to worship a holy God. Thank him for what he has done for us. This is a story that I believe most all of us are familiar with in 1 Kings chapter 21, and starting in verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, and say, Naboth saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters to Ahab, in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles, that were in the city dwelling with Naboth. Now we'll stop reading there, but if you were to read on, you will find that uh, she sent a letter to the leaders and elders there and said, I want you to have a feast. I want you to bring 
Naboth in. I want you to set him up. And then there's going to be some men come in and they're going to say that he blasphemes the king. He blasphemes God. And so therefore take him out and stone him and kill him. And that's exactly what she did. But she not only did that, if you were to look over at 2 Kings chapter 9, 26, she killed all of his family. She had them all put to death so that the king or the, this property could go to the king and give it to the king. Now, as you look at this, it, it, it looks like if you were to read the first part of it, it says that this is not a bad thing. Naboth or, or, or Ahab offered a price. He said, I'll give you something better than what you have. In fact, I'll pay you what it's worth and even more if that's what you want. He said, so you're not going to be out anything. I am going to give you more than its value. The word Naboth means fruit. He owned this vineyard. And, and of course, as we have just read, Ahab, this was next to his summer house or summer palace. And he had a vineyard there. He wanted to add to this vineyard. And so he wanted this property. Now, again, it seems like a, a reasonable offer. But Naboth refused, and he says, I will not give thee. He says it twice, uh, or Ahab repeats what uh, Naboth said. He says in verse 4, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. He said, I cannot sell it. I cannot give it to you. I cannot exchange for something better. And so I want us to look at why did he say no? Why did he say, I will not? I will not sell it. I will not give it. the inheritance of my father, the inheritance that has been handed down. I refuse to do it. Why did he say, listen, it's not for sale. I will not give it to you. Now, when you look at Ahab, I want us to look back for just a moment, moment back in 1 Kings chapter 16, talking about uh, Ahab's father. In 1 Kings 16, verse 25, it says, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. Now remember this. He's the king of Israel. He's not a Gentile king. He's part of God's people. And he says he did worse than any of the kings previous. Now, he is the sixth king of the northern kingdom Israel. You have Judah uh, that is south. And so he is the king of the northern kingdom. And so when he dies off, his son, in verse 28, takes the, the kingdom. So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the thirty and eight years of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, to, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now his father was wicked, but Ahab was even more. And of course, you can't think of Ahab without Jezebel. You see, God was already removed from the kingdom. God was not a part of Israel anymore. When you look at, did a quick study of who Jezebel is. She was the daughter of Ithabel. According to the Bible, Jezebel, along with her husband, instituted the worship of Baal and Asherah on a national scale. Now, it had always been a part of Israel's worship, but it was on a national... Jezebel is introduced in the biblical narrative as a, physician, a Phoenician princess. Again, the daughter of Ithabel. Uh, she was... 
uh, that says she was from Sidon or Sidon, which is uh, the, the uh, now-day Lebanon, is where she was from. And so, of course, Ahab marries her, and she brings in uh, her God, but also she instituted, and, and with Ahab, both Baal and Asherah. How many know the story of Gideon? Remember when God called Gideon and in the middle of the night he went and he cut down his father's grove. He, he cut down his father's uh, poles and it talks about grove. Now what is Asherah? Asherah, the pole god, was a sacred tree or pole that stood near Canaanite religious locations to honor the pagan goddess Asherah, also known as Ashtoreth. Now, according to Judges 3, 7, the sons of Israel did what was that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord, their God, and served the gods of Baal and Asheroth. Again, Gideon became the first one to fight against this. He hid himself because he cut his father's poles down. How about Baal? Baal was the name of the supreme god worship in ancient Canaan and Phoenicia. The practice of Baal worship infiltrated Jewish religious life during the time of the judges. It became widespread in Israel during the reign of Ahab. Now in general, Baal was the fertility god who was believed to enable the earth to produce crops and people to produce children. And so they erected these gods, and, uh, uh, and that became the God of Israel. That's who they worshipped. And he wanted Naboth's vineyard, and he says, Listen, I can't give it to you. There's some reasons for it. Now, I want us to try to parallel that with the church as well. There's some things that we cannot change in the church. Because if we change them, God will say it's your church, not my church. There's too much at stake. You know, talking, I know we joke about age and, and we, you know, you know you're, you're young, you're 56, going to be 57, we're young. And someone says, man, I'm 70. And, 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 and some say, I'm, I'm going to be 90, and, and uh, you, you have all of this. A 16-year-old, uh, you know, it's amazing, a child, how old are you? They're one day into their fourth, you know, they're four years old by one day. Well, I, I'm going to be uh, four and a half. I'm four and a half years old. I'm four years, 11 months. Uh, for us, some of us, you know, when you hit 50, we made it to 50. We're hoping for 60. We're praying God will give us 70. I don't know what I'd do at 80. Uh, 90, my kids will have me in a nursing home. You know, when you hit 100, I'm 103 months. Uh, we go back to, but when you look at age, time goes by very quickly. And the older we get, the more we are to give to our children. I've said this before, you've heard me say it, who's going to take the church? Whose church is this going to be one of these days? Whose church, uh, who's going to stand behind the pulpit? Who's going to be the deacons? Who's going to be the Sunday school teachers? Who's going to take the church? Because if God tarry is coming, all of us are going to die sometime. And so, if you'll turn over to, hold your fingers there, but turn over to Proverbs chapter 22 for just a moment. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. And verse 28. In Proverbs twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, it says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Look at chapter 23, verse 10. Remove not, remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. Remove not, change not, hold strong to. Why? Because there's too much at stake. Why did? I want us to look at why did Naboth refuse the, the, the really the, the request of Ahab, first of all, he refused it because of the word of God. 
He refused it because of the word of God. Now again, as I mentioned, the king's request seems uh, re reasonable. He said, give me your field and I'll give you a better field in return. And, and I'll give you even more fields and I'll give you money. I'll give you whatever you want for it. And that seems pretty reasonable. But Naboth refused to sell because in God's word it says he couldn't sell. If you'll look back in your Bibles at Leviticus chapter 25 for a moment. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 25. In verse 23. Now let me say this again. Ahab is an Israelite. He's a Hebrew. Ahab should have known the law. Ahab should have known the word of God. Naboth knows the word of God. He knows what God's word is teaching. And in verse number uh, 23, the Bible says in, in, in uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, The land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possessions ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possessions, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which thy, his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possessions. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of jubilee, and in the jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possessions." You can read it in Numbers 36, also Ezekiel 46. You see, God said it is not to be sold because it's not yours. It's mine. He said you can't get rid of it. He said that, in fact, the word of God was clear also that the king could not buy the inheritance of the people in Ezekiel chapter 46. The king couldn't come and acquire and take land from the people. And so Naboth says, listen, I cannot do this because the word of God teaches against it. And I am bound by the word of God. Naboth realized that what he possessed was not his anyway. What was he? He was merely the caretaker of the land and of the property that he had. He said, listen, I'll keep the land. It's my family and, and when I die, I'm going to pass this down as an inheritance to my children and them to their children and them to their children. I cannot sell it. I'm merely a caretaker. Folks, we need to take an inventory of all of the things that God has given to us. All that we have come in, in an inheritance that has been handed down to us. Don't think for one moment that the Bible we have, blood was not shed for our Bible. Don't think that sh blood was not shed for our salvation, not just for Christ, from Christ, but the teaching of it. Think about it. We have the church, the Bible, the plan of salvation, our worship, our biblical standards, our godly heritage. We need to remember that this is not ours to give away. It belongs to God. You know, we think about America. America's in trouble. We are a nation that has forgot God. I've heard people say, and, 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 and you have heard me say this before, we say that we are a Christian nation. We've never been a Christian nation, ever. But our nation was built upon biblical principles and biblical ideals. Our, our, our country should be governed by the Bible 
but it has been sold out, not by politicians, not by presidents, not by governors, not by mayors. It's been sold out by the church. You see, we've given in to the preaching. We've given in to the standards. If you were to read on in the, in, in the, in the story, I love the story that goes on and, and, and it talks about how uh, Ahab, uh, he pouted, of course, and, and, and uh, he, he, uh, killed, uh, he killed Naboth and his whole family. And, and so uh, Elijah came to him and told him, what's going to happen? You're going to die. The blood is going to run. The dogs are going to lick your blood. And your wife Jezebel, she's going to be cut in pieces. The dogs are going to eat her up. This is what's going to happen. And old Ahab starts pouting and whining again, saying, oh, I'm sorry for it. And he humbles himself. God hears him. And God said, go to him and tell him I won't kill him. He's going to die, but I'm not going to kill him. But all of the judgment's going to come upon his family, his sons. And then you find him right again, trying to go to, uh, to, to, to Jehoshaphat, saying, hey, listen, uh, there, is, there is land in Syria that belongs to me, and uh, I think we ought to go in. We've had three years of peace, but it belongs to us as Israel. I want to go in and take it. I want to bring war against them. Will you go with me? And Jehoshaphat says, now listen, I want to hear from God first. I want God to tell us that it's okay, because this kind of sounds a little fishy. And so they called all of their prophets in, and they said, uh, they said in verse 6, if you look at 1 Kings 22, then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together. These are the prophets of, of, of Jezebel, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, and shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Now, I think Jehoshaphat here for a second was looking at this. There's something fishy. Now, how do you know or why do you say that? 400 prophets all agreeing? I mean, you can't get three preachers in a room to agree. And you're going to have 400 prophets. And he said, is there nobody else? And the king of Israel said on Jehoshaphat, there is yet one, in verse 8. There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. And so the prophets went to find him and said, hey, now listen, listen, Micaiah, you got to listen to us. Really listen to me. We've already prophesied to the king to go up to Ramoth Gilead. So why don't you come and tell him exactly what we have said to him and everything's going to be okay. And he says, well, well, why don't I just tell him what God tells me to say? He says, because that's not what he wants to hear. He wants to hear what he wants, not what he needs. So why don't you tell him what he wants? And so he went before him and said, hey, listen, go and prosper. Go up. And, and of course, Ahab says, why are you doing this to me? Paraphrasing here, if you read it, it's in the story. What are you doing this to me? Why don't you just tell me the truth? He says, listen, go up, but it's not me telling you to do it. If you go up, you're going to die. But if you are able to come back, prophecy wasn't from me. I'm a fake. I'm not real. They imprisoned him and Ahab was killed on the battlefield. I say all that because of this. This church is not our church. It's God's church. That's why we can't change our doctrine. That's why we can't change our Bible. That's why we can't teaching, quit teaching and preaching about salvation. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. Salvation is not through God. Our, 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 our redemption, our forgiveness, our repentance is, but salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Why can we not? Because there's too much at stake. God said, this is my church. 
And upon this church, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Remember that we are merely custodians of these things. We have to take care of the church. The Bible says back in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We must do the same. Why can we not give in? Why could Naboth not? Because of the word of God. But Naboth also refused because of the will of the fathers. Now again, Naboth's father had passed an inheritance down to him. This was given to him. And in the future, he's going to give it to his children. Of course, uh, Jezebel took care of that, killing all of his sons and children and, and wife and killing. It talks about there that, that, that uh, when they came to him, said, listen, I hear the blood of, of Naboth, but also of his children. You see, if he sold the land, there would be nothing to hand down. You see, that other property would be given back to the original owners on the year of Jubilee. So even if the king had given them the land, that land would have to go back to the king. You say, well, what about the land that, 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 that Ahab took? Wouldn't that have to go back? He would make it where it would never go back to the original owners. And because all of his family was dead, he wouldn't have to give it back. And so Naboth is saying, listen, if I were to give this to you, then what would I have to give to my children? And what you would give me, I would have to give back to you. You see, his inheritance had been passed down by the will of the fathers for centuries, and he refused to sell what they had entrusted him to pass down to others. Thus he said, I will not give it. Do you understand, if we sell our inheritance, we have nothing to give our children. We have nothing to hand down to them. If we give in to what the world wants, uh, uh, it's interesting in that story, I was talking to Brother Potter, the story of, of uh, Ramoth Gilead and Jehoshaphat and, and, and Micaiah there. You know, in that day, understand that the king was the culture. What the king said, that's what you did. If the king were to come out and say, on Thursday you will wear red, on, uh, on Friday you'll wear black, and on, on Monday you'll wear white, whatever he dictated, that's what you had to do. He's the king. So the king was over culture. But in our day, culture is king. Culture tells the pastors what to preach. Culture tells the church what to do. Culture tells us what to accept. But we cannot accept what the world tells us to accept. We need to accept what God's Word teaches. We can't give in. Oh, hey, did you hear about this church? Man, they, they, they kind of give in to some things. And, and, and they, they, they kind of gave a few things. Their Bible they gave up. And, and they gave up some of their doctrines that really aren't that important. And man, their church is just growing like crazy. We ought to do some of those things. No. We need to stand strong in God's Word. What they're doing, they're doing. What God tells us we need to do, we need to do. This is God's Word. What are some of the things that have been entrusted to us to guard? Salvation. Do you know how many preachers are preaching a different plan of salvation today? Easy to believe, believism. That really rules the land. Uh, how many, let me ask you a question. I just want to ask a question here. How many of you, and uh, everyone participate, if you don't agree with the question, don't raise your hand. How many of you believe there's a God? Raise your hand if you believe there's a God. Man, hallelujah. You're all saved. You believe in God. How many believe God loves you? Oh, well, man, there's even more raising their hand. That's good. 
You don't believe in God, but you believe He loves you. I don't know where that comes from. Man, if you believe in God and you realize that God loves you, how many believe that God wants good to come upon you? Now listen, I, 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 know, I know what some of those other preachers are doing. I just, I really can't preach against sin. That's up to God to do that. So many people are hurting. They just need to be encouraged. So as a pastor, is what I'm going to start doing is I'm just going to try to encourage you straight to hell. That's what I'm going to do. Because that's exactly what they're doing. I'd love to say that you believe in God, understand that God loves you, God wants good for you, and all of those statements are true. But God is a God of love, but He's a God of judgment as well. That's from the very beginning of time. When He kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, He put a flaming, uh, put a cherubim with a flaming sword. As you've heard before, the sword represents God's judgment. The cherubim represents God's grace. In all of judgment, God always shows grace. But on that day, you cannot say that, Lord, I, I believed in God. I knew He loved me. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. You cannot do it. You see, salvation has been given to us, and we have to maintain what God's Word teaches. In, first, or in John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I'm the only way. I'm the only way. God's plan is the only way. You can look at it in 1 Peter 1, uh, Acts 4, 12, Acts 16, 21. Of course, Romans 10, 9, and 13. For whoso shall, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we have been given salvation. We must guard salvation, and we do so by proclaiming it. You see, when they say, can we not preach a different gospel? Can we not preach something else? No, I can't preach. What does gospel mean? Gospel means good news. Why would I want to stop giving good news? There's a lot of churches that have given away on that. Just believe in God. Or this easy prayer. Listen, this is all you have to do is all you have to do is say, Lord, come into my heart and save me. Take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for saving me. I'm saved. But it's all they did is said some words, and it changed nothing. You see, the Bible says in Romans 10 that with the mouth confession is made. What does that mean? I agree with God that I'm a sinner who needs repentance. I'm a sinner who needs a Savior, and I'm going to proclaim that truth out. And so we have salvation. Folks, we can never change it. Why? I look around at the little children. I look at my little 15-month-old. And, and think about uh, the second uh, baby that is coming, a second granddaughter that's coming. And how excited we are. And what is my desire? I'm, I'm thinking I'm 70 years old and, and she's a teenager. And if I'm 80, she's, she's starting in college or finishing up college. But I look at, at the mothers here and the babies that are in the nursery and the young people that are in this room, and my desire is that they can come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and live for God the rest of their life. But if we change salvation, then the Holy Spirit can never indwell them because they have a false teaching of salvation. That's been handed down to each and every one of us. Scripture. Many are denying the Word of God in our day. The Bible is still the Word of God. I think of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, where the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now again, I don't believe it contains the Word of God. I believe it is the Word of God. Because what part isn't what part is? What you say isn't, I said is, and what I said is, you say isn't. No, it's the Word of God. Well, how in the world can we have the Word of God? Listen, if you can believe the first four words of the Bible, you have little problem believing the rest of the Bible. In 
the beginning God. If God can create everything out of nothing, I think He can preserve His Word. But we're trying to change the Bible. Why? Because if we change the Bible, there's confusion. Who's the author of confusion? Satan is. He wants to steal what we have. It's still the power, Hebrews 4.12. It's still the truth, John 17.17. 17. It is still inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Listen, we guard it. How do we guard the Word of God? How do we guard the Bible? By reading it, by proclaiming it, and by living it each and every day. It's not a book that, that, that needs to be left at church. It's not a book that needs to sit on a shelf and collect dust. It's not a book that just occasionally we read. No, the Bible is something that we ought to read daily, and the Bible is something that we ought to live out daily as well. Do our children know that God's Word is real in our lives? You know, what is the best way to, uh, to, to, to have my granddaughter come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior? By her daddy and mommy living out the Word of God. By her grandpa and grandma living out the Word of God. By the folks in church that she comes and sees each and every service living the Word of God. She loves us to read to her. It was funny. This is the first time I've seen her do it. She was down in the nursery with her Grammy and... And she walked, she went and got a book and she walked over to the rocker and went like this. And so she sat down and took the book and read it. But uh, we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Or Jesus loves you, this I know. Jesus loves us, this I know. And when you come, yes, Jesus loves me. Now she's hollering, yes. Now she likes the word yes. I, I do realize she likes say, or no, she likes no, but she, we're, we're getting her to say yes. I mean, she'll say, uh, as with all children, and then they start learning verses. They start learning things about the Bible. How did they learn it? By us handing it down to them. You see, the inheritance that I have was handed down by my parents. Pastor, you don't know how hard it is to come to church. I mean, so, we're so busy, so many things going on. Listen, I won't sympathize with anybody in this room, not one person will I sympathize with when I look at my past. I was born and reared on a dairy farm. It's a beef farm now. When I was in first grade, before school, I had to get up and go do chores. My parents are watching. What mean parents would ever have their children do any type of work until they're at least in their 20s? That's when you teach them work ethics. I mean, we would go to church. The nice thing about our family, sometimes we sat in our own pew, <laughs> literally. Man, because, you know, cattle don't listen. And cattle, they're an a, a automatic fertilizer constantly. And they have a tendency, you have a tendency working around them, you get that on you. And we come running in, we're late because chores didn't go like it should, but we're late. We drove 45 miles to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We grow, drove from Sand Lake all the way to uh, Kentwood, to Heritage Baptist Church. There's times you're sitting in church and you go like this and you go, Man, I don't remember anything being in my ear before. And you're trying to look around and you're, you're taking it out and it's that natural fertilizer that... And you're going, oh man, I hope nobody saw this. Or you look and, and, and you comb your hair and stuff's coming out, but you don't have time. And, and we'd get home from church, we would go out and do chores. And then we would come back in, we would get ready, we'd drive back down to church. And we enjoyed going. Now, I'm not saying that I enjoyed doing all the chores. And there were days that were like, man, do we have to go? But church is not a place of convenience to me. It's a place of conviction. Why? Because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. The church is important to me. Why? Because we learned of it in God's Word. 
Salvation is important. The Bible is important. That's why we have to say, listen, salvation and the Bible is not for sale. Separation, churches and the people who make them up are in the business of, uh, of lowering the walls of separation between themselves and the world. The common adage in our day is, uh, to win them, we must become like them. Folks, the world doesn't want what they have. They want something different, and we have to give them that difference. What is it? It's the Word of God. It's a life that's lived. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. We don't need to talk like the world, act like the world, look like the world, or do the worldly things. We ought to be Christ-like. We ought, now listen, I'm not saying go out and act like a bunch of freaks. That is not what I'm saying. I don't believe Jesus was a freak. Man, I'm just a follower of Jesus, the Jesus freak. Jesus was not a freak. Jesus was the Son of God, the most holy that walked the face of this earth. And so our separation... You see, when we look at that, to win them, we must be like them. There's a problem, really, twofold. The first one is, we can't win them. That's God's job. The Holy Spirit has to do a work in their heart for them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we are commanded to be separate from the world. The word separate means to mark oneself off from others by boundaries. It is the picture of building walls of separation between the church and the world. We need those walls of separation in our deeds, our dress, our worship, our standards. Now we guard our separation by staying separated. Listen, when they try to get us to be like them, is what we need to say to them is, listen, it's not for sale. I will not give in to that. Young people, you don't have to do the things that the worldly kids are doing. Stand strong. You say, but you don't understand the pressure. I went to a public high school. I graduated from a public high school. Now I realize that we are living in different times with social media. We're living in a different time with phones and and everything else. I looked up something this morning that I was thinking about, and I said, I'm going to print this off. So I looked it up. I, I, I quick forwarded to my uh, computer. I printed it off, and it's sitting up here on the, on, the, on the pulpit. And information is at our fingertips. But Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. No, not one thing. I was offered drugs. I was offered immorality. I was offered to give something that didn't belong to me that belonged to my future wife. I was offered to give that away. But I'm glad to say that I married my wife pure. I married my wife clean. You don't have to do what the world tells us to do. We can be separate. We as a church should never stop preaching and teaching it. That we need to, to, to make sure that, 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 that we teach the morals, also shouting. Listen, we have been given a heritage of worship in our church. We get to worship the one true God. How many are glad that, that as a pastor, I don't have to say to you, now listen, you have to give so much to the church. You have to be faithful this many times to church. You have to make a trip to Mecca. You have to do this and this and this and this and this and this in order to be saved. How many are glad that the only way for salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, accepting the finished work? We worship the one true God. You look at what's happening in Israel and Palestine and in Gaza. Oh, those wicked Israelites. No, Israel is the rightful owner of all of it. Why did they bomb Israel? Because they hate the Jews, because they hate Jesus. We need to stick with Israel. Now, I'm not for death. I'm not for people dying. But the fact is, is that it's an attack upon the Lord. We have to stay strong. We ought to shout. You know, there used to be a day when the saints of God, the saved, would gather together in the house and and they would, what they used to call, they would go to meeting. How many have ever been in a tent meeting where it got really 
exciting. Somebody say, it got weird. Everybody started saying amen. Everybody said, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I mean, you could, you could feel the Holy Spirit at work, and we don't want that. You see, Naboth wanted what God's Word taught. Ahab wanted what the world had. He's saying, hey, Naboth, let me give you something. And Naboth's saying, no, I think I'll just worship God. I think I'll just believe God. I'll put my salvation in God. You know, there's so much more we could say about it, but our churches have turned to really a place of silence. If I say anything, it's, it's blasphemy to God. There is nothing wrong with saying amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Might even cut the sermon shorter. Never know. <laughs> Man, you Pharisees here. But folks, you and I have been given a tremendous heritage. I'm not saying that it's easy. Our fathers gave us a heritage of holiness, praise, and spiritual power. Many of our fathers died to preserve what we have. The last thing here is Naboth refused because of the worth of the king. If you look at this, I will not give thee. I will not give thee. Naboth is saying you are not worth and not worthy to buy at any price that which I have received by inheritance. It's not for sale. You know, those who would take what we have are not worthy to set foot in our inheritance. We cannot give in. Let me say this, the battle often you don't see, but I deal with it daily. I'm the one that received the phone calls from other pastors and other ministries saying, hey, can we come and, and, and present our work? And I ask them a few questions about it. And I say, I can't have you come. We believe differently, biblically and doctrinally. And more often than not, this is the, the phrase that I hear, oh, you're one of them. What do you mean one of them? Well, you're probably King James only as well. That is true. Oh, you're one of those independent, fundamental Baptists. I am. They mean the fundamentals like the radical Muslims, Islamists. And I'll say to them, what do you mean by fundamental? I am an independent fundamental, which means I believe in the fundamental doctrines of God's Word. We believe in the Bible. But you see, the world's not worthy to take what we have because they don't want you. They just want to put a notch on their belt. That's all they want. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy a church. Is he after the church? Yes, he's after the church. Now let me say this. Is there any problems that you know of that needs to be dealt with? No. But we have to constantly be on guard and say, no, we're not going to do this and we're not going to bring our kids there and, and we're not going to invite you in for this. We're going to stay separated in accordance to God's Word. Yes, there are sister churches and churches of like faith that we fellowship with and encourage to go to their meetings and they come here and they believe exactly like us. We have to stand strong. Why? He refused because of the worth of the king. Folks, we must not give them so much as an inch. For if we do so, we, left, we will be left with nothing to pass down to the next generation. You see, what we have is worth more than pleasing the world, the flesh, and the devil. What we have is worth more than fitting in and being accepted. We must guard what we have at all costs. Nothing matters but pleasing the Lord. You see, when they try to take what we have, we just need to tell them, no, I will not. I said that we, my parents took us to church. We drove 45 miles to church each and every Sunday. Yes, we sometimes went with some items on our 
body that we didn't want. Sometimes you could get the odor of the great barnyard. Well, let me tell you what we did get. We got preaching from the Word of God that really set the standards for my life. Yes, my parents, you look at children, you look at the young people here, do you believe the Bible? Yes, I believe the Bible. Do you believe the doctrines? Of the Bible? Yes, I believe. What do you believe? Well, I believe what my dad and mom believe. I believe what my preacher believes. But at some point, they establish their own home. At some point, those doctrines, those standards, that Bible and the principles that are taught become theirs. Do you believe what your preacher? Yes, but I believe what the Bible teaches. What do you believe, Pastor? I believe what God's Word teaches. And I'm just going to stand strong on what He teaches. We're not going to go to the left. We're not going to go to the right. We're going to stay right down where God's Word teaches. You say, but if we change some things, the church could grow. It's not our church. It's God's church. We need to just preach and teach the Bible. You know, as I mentioned the rest of the story, Paul Harvey, that's who I was thinking of in, in the office, you know, and the rest of the story. How many ever heard Paul Harvey? The rest of the story, well, in verse 4, you have Ahab pouted. In verses 5 through 10, Jezebel plotted. Verses 11, 14 through 14, Naboth perished. But in verses 15 through 29, in the rest of the book, God prevailed. God always prevailed, but because of some wickedness, some people lost their lives. There's too much at stake. The Bible, or you've heard this proverb, many hands make what? Light work. You see, it's not just my job. It's all of our job. You see, what the next generation has tomorrow will be dictated by what we do today. What are we going to do? We're going to stand. We're not going to move. We're just going to keep preaching and teaching the Word of God. You know, the decision dictates our destiny. If you have goals for five years and 10 years and 15 years, what you do today will dictate where you are five years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years down the road. What we do as a church is dictated by the decisions we make today, what has been made in the past, and what are the decisions? It's not for sale. I will not give the world what they want. We'll just keep teaching and preaching the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for Your goodness. Lord, I pray that You will be with us. And, and Lord, that as we look at building upon that firm foundation in the end of Matthew 7, that we will take that and, and we've put our foundation upon You, the rock, and we will continue to build upon that foundation and we won't let the world take what we have. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each and every person here, that here in this church, what we see may not be what is lived out Monday through Saturday. But Lord, I pray that we live out the salvation that we have or the God that we have been taught about. If someone here does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray they don't leave without settling the matter or getting the assurance of their salvation. If someone here this morning, Lord, isn't living for you, Lord, I pray that they will just turn and give their life to you. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He, you, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It means we ask for forgiveness, God, and you make us usable again. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. As the invitation is given in a moment, Lord, if someone doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that they'll come and give their heart and life to you. If someone just needs to talk to you, Lord, I pray they'll come to the altar and give it to you. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. If you would stand to your feet, but